Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to your critique of the week. It's Friday, January 1st, 5th. No, January 5th. Thanks so much for joining me. We're joining you from our new location, from our new studio in the Woodlands, Texas. Um, thanks so much for being here to enjoy these poems. Uh, let's see, who do we have? We have Sharon Ferrantes here. Hello, Sharon. And Katie Dozier downstairs. we got Deb T. Rose is here. Monica Dobos. Uh, D. Coleman. Maney. Uh, Brian O'Sullivan's here. Hello to you. Clayton Clark, Dick Westheimer, uh, Mark Grinier. Good group of people here. Nate Jacob. Hello. Winston Munn is here as well. Tom Barlow. So a really good crew in the audience. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, let's see. And do let us know if there's any problems with the audio or the video or the bit rate or anything. I'm trying to make sure everything looks good. But you never know when you're in a new place. Uh, what problems might pop up. Let's see, over on Facebook, uh, we've got no one yet. The keyframe rate is too low. Hmm. Well, let's see. Well, it's, it's watching. Let's see. So see, we'll see if, uh, if that keeps up or not. Let's see. Our Lisa's here. Uh, Liska's here. Yeah, Katie Dogger says it looks great. Audio looks good. Okay, so there is a thing. So I might have to change some settings. We had a different, um, uh, you know, I imported all the settings from the last place. We had a different, like, video driver. I think I might need to change some settings. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay. Deb T says it looks good, too. Okay, so I think the, the keyframe rate is lower than it should be. Uh, but other than that, we're looking good. Okay, so keyframe rate. I'm saying that so I can look that up later to see what the heck that is. So I can maybe fix it. Um, it should be it should be between two and four seconds, and uh, apparently it's five, whatever that means. Okay, so anyway, thanks so much for joining us on the Critique of the Week. Now, as always, the goal is to give that workshop experience. It's so valuable to everybody um, to let strangers, uh, let people know what strangers think about their poems. So what works, what doesn't, all that good stuff. Um, any kind of comments you can have, um, you know, what lines are the best, what lines are weak, where the cliches are, whatever you can say to... Uh, to uh, Help improve poems is the goal here, as always. And we're going to go take a quick run through the oldest submissions in the queue, which um, I like to do. We're trying, I think my one of my goals this year, my New Year's resolution, is to be more caught up on everything. Um, because it just, it means a lot to people. It is hard because we do, you know, there's different, um, you know, contests and tribute themes and all that stuff that we have to focus on sometimes. Um, but uh, so, you know, there's backlogs of things, but everywhere I can, I'm going to improve um, our response time because it's clear that that matters a lot and it's getting worse around the industry. So we want to be at the top and be doing the best we possibly can. So we're going to try that. I'm going to try to get through so there's not a much of a wait on the critique of the week. So we're, we're still back in January uh, 2023 as far as what we're looking at. So we'll catch up and see as many as we can get to here. Uh, while we're going on. Now, the first poet is Aspen Gage uh, from Indiana. And uh, Aspen submitted a poem called Sighing Out Loud and says uh, in the question group, she says, how can I introduce better form and flow? Is there a theme here that stands out? So that's Aspen Gage. And then this is the poem, Sighing Out Loud. So let's take a look at this. Sighing Out Loud. Here we go. Sighing Out Loud. There's an epigram from Auden. You shall love your crooked neighbor with your crooked heart. And then here's the poem. Hope is the kind of cloud that looks like solid. Or sorry, hope is the kind of cloud that looks solid, though it's not. 
If I can't trust my eyes, I trust the news, which is saying rain 10% chance, storm clouds and strong winds. I know this blue sky is an illusion our brain constructs to atone for telling constant lies. Right now, the clouds look like cotton candy, and suddenly tongue and teeth taste sticky sweet, and I can smell a carnival. But I'm not home. In my small town, walking amongst pig shit, popcorn machines, sneaking sips from a flask of cinnamon e heat, I am rerooted under hydrangea bush, speaking to birds and bugs, the barn animals or frost-coated squirrels, the blue sky shot ghastly city gray, the happy sensation of nothing to do, muddled by anxious wondering. I trust the news when they tell me it may rain, even though I will see it not. Er, I see it will not. Inertia keeps lightheartedness centered in my home. I leave it behind too often. Through my window, I see my neighbor who gardens step onto his back porch and tend to his overhang of strawberries splitting the calm with their blood burst. Cherry tomatoes challenging each new bloom, setting the example he teaches me from time to time about growth, about loving something so much it doesn't matter about hope or sight. Hope is a dead end. The results the thing you really want, he says to me. You have to see it, then it comes. I don't think he knows much about science or rain or probabilities. He shakes his head now, fingering a wilting vine, budless and taut. My wave goes unreturned. I falter on the way to check the weather. Instead, look up to see clear skies, 70. My neighbor sighs out loud. Hope floats just like a rain cloud, too. On and on until it's ready to dazzle, until it turns into truth. So I really like the the ending of that poem. Um, I I think it really picks up steam later on. I mean, it sort of starts out slow is my first impression of it. Um, Let's see. Deputy says there's going to, oh, it says there's going to be a special lesson at the top. Yeah, I think I just left that from last time. Um, uh, I was thinking about it, but, but what we're going to do, actually, I, I peeked ahead in a couple poems up, we're going to do, uh, there's a poem that's in the uh, Frastic Challenge. And, uh, and so we're going to talk about, about that and about the poem, uh, that works. So I think that that sort of st- sticks in for the, uh, for the special lesson <laughs> we were talking about before. But anyway, so this is Sighing Out Loud and, and it did, I feel like it, it took a while to get into, but once it did, I felt more connected and so, so let's take a look at, at how we enter the poem. <laughs> Kate Hooter says, every lesson is special. Yeah. Rose says, I can smell a carnival. Nice. Yeah, I like that line too. So let's see. So how do we get a little bit quicker into this poem? Because to me, it felt too long. But once it took off, it started to move. Yeah. So Liska says the same thing. Um, Sharon Ferrante, of course, who loves short poems, says the last three lines would be my poem. Yeah. Yeah, and so Maney says, my attention was drifting in the middle. It might be too long, but I do like some of this quite a lot. Yeah, and so that's the thing. So this is another, which is so common, and so let that be a lesson to everybody, that condensing is uh, is always going to be something that we really um, we really think should be done. Uh, you know, you want the poems to be as con- as dense as possible with emotional content, with um, you know visible imagery, all sorts of things like that. You want it tightly packed so it has the most impact. Um you know, I mean, I always think about, I probably used this metaphor before, but it's the winter, so I always think about this. But, you know, when you're throwing a snowball at somebody, right? If you have, like, one of those balls of ice and you, and it's, like, even, it's small, but you hit them with it, um, you know, it, it hurts. And if you say, if you have, like, a big sort of loosely conglomerated ball of snow, and it's the same amount of snow and water you throw it at somebody. It just sort of splashes off and it's just, it doesn't. <laughs> and so when I was a kid, we always tried to pack our snowballs as tightly as possible. And they can also travel much farther when they're packed tightly as possible, too. So that snowball analogy, keep in mind, poems are like snowballs. And make sure that you... Um, <laughs> that you, uh, you pack your snowballs tightly. So we're going to try to figure out what we can do here um, to do that. So hope is the kind of cloud that looks solid, though it's not. So it's a nice, I think the first line was nice. The first line um, engaged me. It, it's, in a, it's one of those, you know, we, we talk about the best lines in poems a lot of the times, and, and the best lines are often these sort of blunt statements that, uh, you know, that, that say the truth with a kind of confidence. And I think that works really well. Tom Barlow says, I think uh, Dickinson owns hope. The, the hope was a thing with feathers. But, um, but yeah, but I think, uh, I think it's, a, it's an homage or a nod to that. And I think that works. Um, 
Let's see. Mary Keating says it feels like there are many poems in this one. Yeah. Um, okay, so anyway, so hope is the kind of cloud that looks solid, though it's not. And so I think, you know, so that's a good intro. I, to me, that's a good. Um, I, I think just because Dickinson said it, I think there's a different, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's, it, it's, a, it's a nod to Dickinson. I don't have any problem with, with you know, having that kind of illusion back. But then if you can't, oops, what did I do? There we go. If you can't, if I can't trust my eyes, I trust the news, which is saying 10% chance storm clouds and strong winds. So, so I think this uh, section, um, I would cut, you could jump right into, um, you know, the news says rain 10% chance storm clouds and strong. I don't think the rest we don't really need. We can jump faster into the poem just by going right there. The news says 10% chance, blah, blah, blah. Um, I know the blue sky is an illusion our brain constructs to atone for telling constant lies. And again, I think I know the blue sky is an illusion. I think it, our brain constructs. I think that works. But to atone for telling constant lies, I think that it just pushes it too far. Um, let's see. Get the comments again. I'm going to slide this over. Get my arrangement to be perfect right now. Okay. So, um, yeah, another poet... Let's see. So Deb T says, I did. I like the first line. You even said it before Tim did. You beat me to it, Deb. Um, another poet. Where was the other? Um, let's see. I'm not sure. Another poet said something somewhere that might have been too harsh. I don't see it. But anyway. Um, so, so I would you know, trim out stuff like this. But I'm highlighting the kind of things I would trim out. Right now, the cloud looks like cotton candy and suddenly tongue and teeth taste. So, yeah, so if you jumped in here, just imagine this first stanza. If we skipped the, the sort of filler, the sort of fluff, and we jumped into the actual like meat of the poem a little quicker, going right here. Hope is the kind of cloud that looks solid, though it's not. The news says rain, 10% chance, storm clouds, and strong winds. I know the blue sky is an illusion our brain constructs. Um, right now the clouds look like cotton candy. Uh, the cotton candy clouds is too much, but, um, um, so how about the clouds suddenly change and teeth taste sticky sweet and I can smell a carnival. So the cotton candy clouds, uh, I don't know. I, I, I like the, I can smell a carnival line, but the cotton candy clouds is pretty cliche. So, um, hmm. Yeah. James Edgar says the 10% chance takes me out of the poem. The, the percentage there. Yeah. Paul Mitchell Bernstein, Cotton Candy Clouds, no. Yeah. I, I, but I, let's say I like the carnival, though. Can we? Is there a way we can say it that's different? Because um, it, it does get us to the carnival. But, yeah, but it is too cliche. It, it really takes you out of the poem. So maybe there's a totally different intro here. Um, or, or what can we slice it down? This is one of the things I wish I had the... Uh, a file up but when we're doing a quick quicker movement through these poems i can't edit it actually i can just talk and point but um um yeah well let's see where, where maybe a better intro would be but i'm not home in my small town walking amongst pig shit popcorn machines see it's the carnival moves just through the poem in a nice way um Paul Mitchell Bernstein says clouds like sponge sugar. That's much nicer. Yeah, yeah. That's a good idea. So let's do it like that. Let's say clouds like sponge sugar. And we'll, we'll just make it not a cliche. And then you can kind of brush right past it. You don't really notice it's a cliche because we're getting into the good stuff, which is uh, the teeth taste sticky sweet and I can smell the carnival. Then we can leap into the walking amongst the pig shit and popcorn machines. I like that line a lot. Um, sneaking sips from a flask of cinnamony heat. I wouldn't do the cinnamon E. I would just say cinnamon heat. Um, I am rerooted under hydrangea bush, speaking to birds and bugs. Hmm. And so this is a, a sort of a drift away from um, sort of, you know, it's, it's a transition in the poem. We go from the carnival, which I think was working pretty well. We go to, I am rerooted under hydrangea bush, speaking to birds and bugs. The barn animals are frost-coated squirrels and blue sky shot ghastly city gray I, I, I'm, it's getting a little cluttered here i'm having trouble following that a little bit um yeah mary keating says maybe start with a, a i can smell a carnival that's a good idea too yeah I, that could be we could i start yeah sighing out loud i can smell a carnival teeth taste sticky sweet you, you can jump in there and then walking through the pig shit and popcorn machines i think that's a good suggestion 
Um, for this section, though, I, I'm feeling a little like I'm not really seeing it. I was I was at the carnival. I felt that those images really strongly. Um, I'm rerouted under hydrangea bush. Uh, I, the rerouted kind of makes me a little. I'm not sure about that. Uh, of what that really means. I'm rerouted under the hydrangea bush. Speaking to birds and bugs. I like the speaking to birds and bugs. There's a nice sound of birds and bugs. The barn animals are frost-coated squirrels. The blue sky shot ghastly gray. Um, is is the carnival? Yeah, Mary Keating says the. Um, uh, this is another poem. It feels like the shift is so like we were at this place where we thought we knew where we were, and then um, and then we're we're moving, um, and, and I'm not just I'm just not seeing this part as well. I, is the barn animals referring to the carnival, like the like? I think maybe a, a better transition would help if that's the case. And, and the rerouted is strange. I think maybe the word rerouted is what's throwing us off. Um, instead of rerouted, well, like, but I'm not at the carnival. I'm under a hydrangea bush. The barn, you know, and then we can have that transition. Yeah. D. Coleman just said something similar. Yeah, good. I agree. Um, so then we can, and we can cut some of this back. Um, I see. I, it, let's see. Where we go? I trust the news when they tell me it may rain, even though, and so it's a callback to the very beginning, even though I see it will not. Inertia keeps lightheartedness centered in my home. I think I would cut, I mean, that just, this kind of talking stuff doesn't propel us forward very well. Um, so I would, I would trim this kind of thing in, in this line. I leave it behind too often through my window. So you just cut that. I mean, what does this really add? I trust the news when they tell me it may rain, even though I see it, it will not. Through my window, I see my neighbor who gardens. So we can just trust that. Like, drop the commentary. Let us let us make our own conclusions, and we'll feel them more. Um, my neighbor who gardens step onto his back porch and tend to his overhang of strawberries, splitting the calm with their blood burst. Yeah, I, I like when the—so I like the carnival, and I like when the, the neighbor emerges. So, so really want to use that metaphor, then get to the neighbor— as quickly as we can. Um, okay. Um, tomatoes chal cha uh, challenging each new bloom, setting the example. He teaches me from time to time about growth. Um, I'd probably cut this too. The challenging each new bloom. We don't need all that either. Um, we could just jump to he teaches me from time to time about growth, about loving something so much it doesn't matter, about hope or sight. Um, hope is a dead end. The results, the th uh, the thing you really want, he says to me. There's something about the the way this is done, you, you know, without quotes here. And then we add the quotes here. The single quotes are only really for um, if you're if you're quoting within a quote. Um, so use double quotes. Um, in the U.S., period goes inside the quote too. Uh, in the U.K., they do it that way. Um, but but use double quotes there. And then also the way this, like, is he speaking this? Or is it a summary? Um, I think I would probably drop the quotes all, all together and just sort of let it be ambiguous a little bit, whether he was saying it or it's a summary. Um, I think that makes it just, you don't have to question it and work, work your way through it. Um, I don't think he knows much about science or rain or probabilities. He shakes his head now, fingering a wilting vine, budless and taut. My wave goes unreturned. I falter on the way to check the weather. Instead, look up to see clear skies, 70. My neighbor sighs out loud. Hope floats like a rain cloud, too, on and on until it's ready to dazzle, until it turns into truth. So I really like the ending. So I think, I think the ending works. Um, yeah, so I think if we, if we just look back at what we trimmed, the poem would be about... 60% of the length, sorry to use percents, <laughs> but 60% of the length, um, and I think much tighter. Um, and what about the title, Sighing Out Loud? I think that the title could maybe do a little more too. Um, I think I think something, and we'll go back to this, which is just a one piece of insight um, I really loved. Who was it that said, um, uh, what's his uh, Kim Stafford, it was Kim Stafford, that is, who said, um, you know, if you're trying to find a title, write three titles. Do a really simple title, um, a really long title, and a really weird title, and see which one feels best. Um, you know, do that kind of you know iteration and winnowing down process. And I think that would be helpful here. You know, a title that kind of summarizes. See see what that would do for you. Try to make it long, and then try to make it really strange, and then see which one which one is best. Ah, uh, Mary Keaton says, call it cotton candy. That could work, actually. Um, 
So anyway, I think those are the suggestions. It's just a tightening process and, and make the title a little stronger. And I think the poem works because the ending is really nice. I like the progression. Um, and I kind of like the the um, ambiguity of what it's saying, where it has a message, but it's not being hit me over the head with it. So I like that aspect of it, too. Um, yeah, Tembarlis is a title that sets the poem in a place would be helpful. Yeah, or just, you know, the kind of thing... Um, uh, the kind of thing, not really place, but just a, a sort of a, a, it allows you, one of the things that we, we've shown many times is that, that book of Hyben, um, and how in a Hyben, there's the prose, there's the, um, there's the haiku, and then the title, and there's sort of three separate things, which allow you to put things up into contrast and juxtaposition with each other. And that's an opportunity here in the title to like speak something that's not within the poem. Um, and so give us a sense of the background. You know, after I failed my driver's license test, and then he jumped into the poem, hope is the kind of cloud that looks solid, though it's not. You know, I mean, whatever it is that sort of motivated the poem, I think that we could help us get more attached to it with some kind of title that added some detail. Okay, well, let's move on, because I, I always take too much time. I, I, we're supposed to be speeding through these, uh, <laughs> and I'm terrible at that. That's one thing I, I really get better at. But I just love talking about poems. It's fun. So we'll... Um, We'll, uh, we'll do this. We'll go on to the next one. I think the next one's the one that I saw. Nope, not quite yet. Uh, I think the next one after this one is the one that's based on uh, Ekphrastic Challenge. So we'll talk a little bit about the Ekphrastic Challenge. Uh, but this poem is by um, Menea Ienat um, from, where's it? Like Hungary? I can't remember where Menea is from. Uh, Timasora. What, what country is that? I can't remember. But but Menea has been, uh, we critiqued uh, Menea's poems before. Um, so this is a little a short, a short one um, to add to the pile. If you if you I think the general rule if you've had a critique, give it a year, but then you feel free to send again. I think, uh, and that's totally fine. So let's take a look at the short poem. It's called X. Uh, here we go. X. At night he perched on the pile of wood with a white face like of the vintage village girls who did not see the sea. Dogs bark in the dark seeming rather vuvu, vuvuzelas. It, yeah, vuvuzelas. Am I saying that right? That's the that kind of thing that they the bang on, right? You bang two sticks together. Is that the vuvuzela at a, at a football match? Seeming rather vuvuzelas at a championships league final. The moon stands crucified like a broken lantern. Shards are sleepy stars after a night of alms. Only the branches thinned by the darkness, they seem more like the fingers of some witches, hunted by the blind inquisition of the laundry stretched to dry. So right away, great images in this poem. Um, I really, uh, really like the, the visuals, especially toward the end. Hmm. Yeah. It's a plastic horn says uh, Dick Westheimer. So it's not the things that I'm thinking of. Okay. But but it is something that makes a lot of noise. I, I want to look it up. Let, let's look it up a, a picture of that. Just because I'm curious. Vu, vu, zelas. Oh, it's just a straight horn type thing. Okay, let's... It's this kind of thing. Vu, vu, zelas. So like these kind of horns. Okay, that's very cool. Okay, so at night, perched on the pile of wood with a white face, like, I don't understand this, I trip over it every time. I'm not sure what the title is. Is this part 10 of a section that's been sent? It doesn't say in the notes. Um, so, let's see. So at night, perched on the pile of wood with a white face, like, of the village girls. So I'm really confused about that. Like, of the village girls? Is that a construction? I trip over that every time I've read it. I can't really resolve it syntactically. A white face is like the village girls who did not see the sea. Dogs bark in the dark. So, so um, the village girls who did not see the sea and the dogs bark in the dark, the images, I think, work well in an interesting way, but I don't know what they have to do with the white face or the pile of wood. So I'm a little confused about that. Seeming rather vuvuzelas at a championship football league. So, so what is seeming? At night, he perched on the pile of wood with a white face, like, so, so a white face, so the white face again is like the vuvuzelas? It's, it's just hard to follow. I, uh, yeah. 
And D. Coleman says too, is the title of the letter X or is it supposed to be 10? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. So there's a lot of, a lot of mystery in this poem. Um, yeah, the moon stands crucified like a broken lantern. Shards are sleepy stars. I think that's a, it's an interesting image there. After a night of alms, only the branches thinned by darkness. They seem more like the fingers of some witches, hunted by the blind inquisition of the laundry stretched to dry. I love the of laundry stretched to dry. I think it's a great ending. But I feel too... Um, hmm. I feel I feel just a little too lost in this poem where I can't really connect with it. So I, I like the images. Um, and there's not. I'm not getting the sense of like deeper beneath it, there's something that if I th- sat with it long enough uh, that I would... Yeah, Mary Picot says, uh, we don't know who he is. Yeah, it's just so detached that I can't really connect. Even though I like the images, I like some of the sounds. Um, you know, we just need more. Like, like why... Um, you know, why would we read and remember it if we can't tell exactly what, you know, what's going on? Uh, Guy Chambers says the title doesn't fit. Um, Nancy Sabanek says uh, white face equals not sun-kissed by being out on the sea. I mean, that's a question. Yeah, Sharon Front is confused. Deb T says, I agree, intriguing images, but I'm not getting the meaning. So we just need more. Um, oh, so uh, this is, might be an access. So um, Naliema... Um, Carcanus says, uh, I think it's about the moon. And so, so is he, is he the moon? At night, he, the moon, perched on the pile of wood with a white face like, and they may have that trippy part where I don't understand, but of the village girls who do not see the sea. Dogs bark in the dark. Hmm. Seeming rather, so uh, the moon, but then we say the moon. The moon stands crucified like a broken lantern. Hmm. Moon personified. It could be. Yeah. Mary King says, unlike the previous poem, this poem needs more for us to grab onto. Yeah, exactly. So find a, finding a balance between the two poems is actually the key kind of to writing a good poem that works. Because um, this one leaves us too in the dark, no pun intended. The other one sort of went on too long about stuff we already understood. So, yeah, I don't feel grounded. Where are we? The horn nods to South of Africa. Um. And then, yeah, as Brendan Sullivan says, I mentioned this before as a possibility, but X as the Roman numeral, maybe this is an excerpt from a long poem. It could be that, but it's all we have to work with. So I think just we have to let us in. Give us a title. um, Let us know who he is. Those kind of things so we can have a connection with it. Because there's some really lovely images. I especially like... um, uh, you know, the they seem, the, the last three lines, they seem more like the fingers of some witches hunted by the blind inquisition of the laundry stretched to dry. I love that laundry stretched to dry. That's a really great, great last line. So anyway, so give us more to that that we can work with. Okay, let's go on to the next poem. And next we have... Uh, Oops, I should be careful about that. So, okay, so we're not even to that. I, I, flipped, I flipped through these really quick, and one of them was an ekphrastic challenge. And I should have started with that if I was thinking, <laughs> but I wasn't. So here, this is a uh, hold tight. Let me, let me, is there any, yeah, no questions either. Yeah, no questions. All we have, the, it's pacing the thing, hold tight. So one of those things, this is kind of like reading submissions. We have no idea what's coming up. You, you see the title and the metadata, really, and then this pasted in. So let's see what happens. Sunlight gleaming, though the windows shining brightly on her face. I had surely been better day, seen better days. Did another dismal morning, happier days I miss. Hold tight, I told her. Together we will get through this. Trying hard to not shed a tear, though all I could see in her eyes was fear. Fear of leaving all that she had. Fear of starting something new. Hold tight, I told her. After all, it's not so bad, wiping her tears and resting her head on my shoulder. Is it me, or is it or me, I wondered? Um, oops, sorry. Or did summers in July just get colder? I gotta find out. Okay. Painfully taking small steps toward and not looking back at all that we lost. Hold tight, I told her. This is merely a small cost. My own tears left unwiped. I take it in good stride. She needs me more than ever. Hold tight, I told her. We will always remain by her side. That's the bottom of the poem. So so here again, similar to the last poem, um, 
but less rich with sort of specific details. You know, it's sort of a, a vagueness to the images, but then also we're feeling lost. So really the, the thing we want to start out with always with a poem, um, you know, if we're just starting out, you can sort of experiment and push boundaries and try different things. Um, but um, at the end of the day, you know, telling a story, letting us know who, what, why, where, when, those kind of things. So we feel a sense of groundedness, get those something that we can hold on to that we at least know where we are. At least we know who's speaking um, or at least we see the, some kind of scene really clearly so we can enter. This. You know, the, a poem is sort of this magical space where we're conjuring up sort of a portal to another dimension and, and let us see something so we can enter and we're not just sort of floating around in limbo. You have to have something kind of like that, um, you know, t- to let us connect with it. And then once we have something that we can hold and kind of enter, then we can start to see other details and, and the emotions and the feelings can resolve themselves out of that. But but this, we're so ungrounded. We don't know who the I is. We don't know who the, the her is. Um, and we don't get a lot of concrete, tangible things that we can sort of hold on to with our mind. Um, and so... So start with those details. Like, don't hold back. Tell us the actual story. Tell us who you're talking to. Tell us who the, the she is. And then and then make us actually see with really specific details. Sunlight gleaming through the windows, shining brightly on her face. Um, uh, you know, show us what, what, what kind of windows those are. They're just, right now, they're generic abstract windows. Like, what kind of light? What is the sort of the quality of the light? Um, you know, those kind of things. What does her face look like? What's the expression on her face? Something that we can see and sort of feel. Um, yeah. So, actually, somebody asked me about this. So, Paul Mitchell Bernstein says, someone once told me to avoid gerunds whenever possible. Uh, what do we think about that? Gerunds are a word that I, uh, I forget. <laughs> I forget the word unless I see the word. But those are the ING words. And so, there are a lot of, um, you know, fear of leaving all that she had, fear of starting something new, hold tight, I told her, after all, it's not so bad, wiping her tears away and resting her head on my shoulder. Um, the thing with when you use that present tense in the ING or everything, there's a tendency to sort of want a poem to feel active. Um, and did the Facebook feed die? Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. So anyway... Did the Facebook feed die? I don't know. I think the key frame rate is too low. Yeah, so that's, that's actually, I can fix that later. But anyway, it, it looks like it's playing for me. Anyway, um, but yeah. Yes, yeah, so what I was saying about the gerunds, which are the ING words, once you start conjuring, so, so there's a tendency um, to want poems or, or just any kind of writing to feel really active. Like if I use that, like I'm doing this right now, there's this tendency to like, it's sort of like an artificial activeness to it you know where if it's the past tense um you know in your mind so you don't feel like it's as um is present or it's going to be felt as present as you do then and then the problem too is that you have this ing sound over and over again and so there, it gets really repetitive too so it's almost it's not like it's something you shouldn't do but it's a trap you can fall into that sort of deadens the music and makes it almost feel like melodramatically active you know, it's like a lack of trust that the reader will feel present. So you make the poem extra present. And I think that it just feels a little like you're trying too hard. And, and there's, so there's a way that it's a little harder to connect, I think. Um, and Dick Westheimer says, the other problem with gerunds is that they add soft sounds and extra syllables to the music of the poem. Exactly. And it's really repetitive because in that tense in English, you know, all the verbs are, are conjugated in the same way. And so it's the same thing over and over again. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so anyway, uh, let's move on. So we want more concrete details. Who, what, why, where, when, and how. That's the, the gist of this poem. Let's, let's take a look at the next one. Um, hmm. Let's see. So I'm looking to, I'm just trying to look at the details of the stream. Uh, but anyway, let's take a look at the next poem. I think this better be the one with the Euphrastic Challenge in it, because I thought, yeah, it is. So this was, um, oh, I thought I had it. I thought I, um, let me try to find it. This is the um, the image, if I can remember which month this was. But this is the Euphrastic Challenge image. Um, and it was, 
let's see, it was the, it was like, it was like a, I remember it was like a May or a June of maybe 2022. That's what I'm guessing. Can I find it fast enough to, to be, Bella the Bay, take heart, warm. Unfortunately, all I have are, um, Struck Shop, Anonymous was a woman. Well, anyway, this was the image that we did. There's so many to choose from. Could it have been 2021? I figured if I would see the title, it would just I would just immediately be like, oh, yeah, that's the one. Because it was something, because if you can't, I, I guess, scroll up a little bit. She's dancing in a, in a frying pan. Um, gosh, cloud dance? No. Bucket? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, maybe somebody in the comments can tell me which month, which month and year this was, if you can find it for me. But anyway, this was an ekphrastic challenge. If you're, if you're new to Rattle, we've been doing this for over 10 years now. Um, we take an artist every month, we post the poem online, um, and then about 500 people every month write a poem in response, in reaction to that. Ekphrastic, originally the word comes from the Greek, it means to like describe, and so originally it was a description of a painting. Because remember, a long time ago, writing was, was very functional, a lot more functional kind of than it is now, because we didn't have all these different medias, we couldn't just look at the image. So descriptions of that were really important, and that's where the word comes from, but it becomes writing about art, and this is poems about art. Um, and, and what we want to do is, is take it somewhere surprising and different and, and sort of add to the experience of the painting, not just describe, but, but take it in a different direction, guide our emotions and our feelings and our reaction to it, see the painting in a new way, do something interesting with it. So it's a, it's a collaboration between the artist and the author. Um, and, and that's what we want to do. And a lot of times a great way to start an ekphrastic is just to start describing it and then letting your mind wander and play with that description you know, so she dances barefoot on the pot. You, know, you can start that way and then see where your, your mind takes you, you know, and, and I think that's a great way to go about it. Um, this submission was an entry, a very short one for the Ekphrastic Challenge. So um, let's read it. And, and the poet, I should say, sorry, was um, Adrian Lee. So let's see. Playing with fire, do you desire? Seeing her dance, watching her stance, effortless in her beautiful tangerine-colored dress. Her glares create huge scares, keeping my distance. I admire her existence. Her auburn hair cannot compare. Playing with fire, do you still desire? So, so that's an interesting take on the poem, or on, on the painting, I should say. Um, but, but to me, what sets it apart from one of the winners, and maybe, has anybody mentioned... Let's see. February 2023. Oh, I skipped past it. That's why I missed it. It wasn't as long ago as I thought. Thanks so much, Nate, for Sharon Ferrante, uh, Lori Fanning. A bunch of people pulled it up. So let me let me go back because I, I thought it'd be interesting to see what we actually chose. And we can compare the difference between the two. Um, it is a long, a long. Oh, yeah, here we go. The Kitchen Goddess. Joanne Tucker's The Kitchen Goddess. Yeah. And I was thinking when I saw this that the poet, anyway. Here we go. This, so this is what we chose. Um, this is Luisa Giulianetti. Um, and that was uh, this. Let's just take a look at the actual poem. The Rebirth of Venus. How long is it? Yeah, let's read this one. This is the one we actually chose. So you can see if you, if you look over at Playing with Fire, um, we had a sh pretty short poem that didn't go anywhere different. It sort of just stayed with describing it. It, it sort of talked about the relationship maybe with the viewer um, and the painting, you know, I admire her existence, her auburn hair, but, but it's just describing the painting. It stays on that level. Uh, it's, it's like the original, you know, meaning of Ekphrasis, which is what I was just describing, but, but there's, that doesn't really do a whole lot with us. Now we want to add, we want to make the experience of the painting even more profound and powerful. And so let's see, uh, let's see what the poet here did. This is the rebirth of Venus. I blew that half shell. Took the waiting shore, found new digs, and never looked back. Feet happily calloused and belly full. In this kitchen I reign supreme. Stir my own pot, garland my tresses with wild rosebuds. My monarch grown wings marigold as I glissade across the marble maple floor to the waiting catch. 
I hold a fan scallop between my thumb and forefinger, slide the knife and twist, prize, op- prize open the hinge, free, uh, free plump flesh from its frilly skirt, rinse dry salt, sear the lot in cast iron, tang their sweetness with fresh orange, pair with earthly fennel, create counterbalance like dancing, like mercy, arms bowed, in offering for this body that spins me, holds me, I linger in betweenness, falling in stillness, the firm and lays of muscle, my tongue curls sturdy steed, seeds, cradle supple bites, the ancient skillet seasons flavors anew. A feast, I feast memory, ocean, sand, brine, instead of praying I saute, leap, the world glorious and hungry beneath my feet. And so that was the artist's choice. And of this, uh, the artist says, um, I was delighted and surprised at the range of emotions and different journeys that were expressed in the poem which I reviewed. So I, I, I didn't look at this ahead of time, obviously, so I have no idea, but exactly what we're talking about, a range of emotions and different journeys. So, so what she does with, the, with the, the painting here, you know, she takes it and imagines the figure in the painting before and after this image. So it turns sort of the, the still the photograph almost, you know, that that's still into a whole movie and a whole story and adds this whole story to it. And so that's what we're talking about with being additive. And the other poem just wasn't additive. Um, and there's a whole, you know, any ways your imagination can think of to, to make it additive. Um, but we want, we want poems that, that add to the art. And I think that's what you'll see. That's the universal thing with whether it's the artist's choice or the editor's choice. It's something that adds to it. That, that conveys, you know, some of the feeling maybe. A lot of times the artist wants it to be closer to the feeling that they were inspired by, which is, is a, it's something I've noticed is fine too. But they always want it to be an expansion of that feeling and to put into words um, and to add things and not just um, sit where you were. Um, let's see. Let's take a look at the other one though too because I, I think it's interesting to just do this. And the other one, the editor's choice, and I think at the time it was still me. Maybe it was Megan. Let's see. Was Megan doing these? Nope, it was still me back then. Okay. And so this was my choice. Joy. I used to say I felt like I was running to catch a train. A toddler in one arm, our boy hanging on to my jacket. I used to say we ran on marbles, reaching for the train handle in the days after my husband's sudden death. Our boy would say, you're holding my hand too tight, it hurts. I wouldn't allow our daughter's feet to touch the ground. Anything could happen. Then one day at the kitchen window, I looked out and watched our children play baseball with spruce cones and sticks, the dog leaping and twisting his cheerleader. And I mean this, they shone. Shrubs behind them dropped glitter. The air bristled with light. The brilliant forest throbbed, and it lasted, and we danced away from that train. And so what we get is this image um, in, in this poem, Joy, uh, and that I should say, it, it was Melissa Medensky. Um, this painting became a metaphor for the experience of um, being a single parent after um, the, the father died. And so, um, um, and so we get that, um, that expansion into a new story in, in the, the painting where it was just whatever we interpret it when we experienced the painting the first time um, becomes this entire way that we can relate to it that maybe we wouldn't have seen that at all. We probably wouldn't have. Um, but this was the, the viewer, the poet's reaction to the painting, and it expands our understanding and our thinking and, and how we feel about this painting. And that's, what, that's the, what we're looking for. And so if we go back to the original, Playing with Fire, um, you see that? I mean, that's just the main thing, that we don't get that. Um, beyond that, you know, so, so we just stick with the painting here. We don't add any kind of detail or story. I mean, both those two, pain, those two uh, poems that won that week added story, added context, made us look at the thing differently. And this one sticks where it is. So that's the, the first thing. Um, secondly, it's, it's sort of, it's short and the rhymes are pretty strict. You're playing with fire. Do you desire um, seeing her dance, watching her stance. So the lines here are really driven by the rhyme. Um, and what you want poems to be driven by is your sort of creative subconscious, not the rhyme. The rhyme can cut sudden guide and steer and make surprising things happen. But we aren't just writing to fit the rhyme. And that's what it feels like here. Um, it feels like you can see how this poem was generated. You know, playing with fire, do desire was a uh, phrase that came out. And then we tried to match that with the next line, seeing her dance, watching her stance, effortless in her beautiful tangerine-colored dress. 
Uh, her glares create huge scares. Um, and so we're just letting the rhyme propel that. And we're not you know, pushing into our own imagination. So to so push into your imagination, that's always what we want to see. We love each, you know, we love seeing inside each, someone else's soul. That's what poetry really is. And that means letting your imagination out on the page, not just being guided by the sounds of, of what, what the words say. So um, let's see. I, I don't know if, this, if there's any other comments. I thought, I thought it was interesting to take a look at those. Uh, Paul Mucha Bernstein says it reminds me of the famous image of Kali standing on Shiva. Um, let's see. Nate Jacobs says, would be fun to have a critique of the week on the week we all get told nope to look at each other's near misses, suggest improvements. It's not a bad idea. Uh, Dick Westheimer says the fasted challenge is such a challenge. <laughs> um, yeah. So... And then Dick Westheimer, too, another important point. Um, Dick says he always um, uh, responds to the challenge with poems that will stand on their own without the image. I think that's important, too. But we don't have to see, you know, in my book, uh, American Fractal back there, I have a couple of frastic poems in there. They don't, they mention what the painting is, but they don't, um, they, they work up that your psyche takes you. Um, yeah. Um, BC McSee says, uh, what do you call a poem inspired by describing a piece of music? I, I'm not sure. Maybe, I don't know if anybody knows. I've never heard that. Um, or, or just sounds in general. Um, there's just not a whole lot of it, but that'd be interesting. And I'm trying to think if there's any, I mean, um, one of my favorite sonnets uh, is the Kim Anitzio's The Sound. You know, Mark says, the suffering we don't see still makes a sort of sound. It's subtle, soft. Not the, the cries or screams that we might think of, you know. It goes on about that sound of of a sigh and a kind of a the sound of like sad resignation or something like that. So there's, a, there's some poems I can think of that do that, but there's aren't that many, not enough maybe for a word. Um, yeah, it might just be still like frastic, as as Mary Picault says. So maybe. Um, anyway, let's move on to another poem. We have 10 minutes. Hopefully we can get to two more poets at least because I really want to do more than four. Um, so here, we'll move on. But so, so in the Ephrastic, you know, expand, you know, describe, but then move on. Okay. Let's see. Uh, oops, I don't want to. Okay. So this is uh, William Manus. And here we go. No questions. Um, baby, let's hit that bank. There will only be a few moments where no one will notice. The end we could give them will be so perfect and planned, so will. It will be our last robbery, our great payout. No feeling to distract, no tragic sleep to wake from, no guilt to hide, only warm lahayim that slides down easily, easily on your shoulders. I don't know what Lahayim is, warm Lahayim. We'll just have to keep our new fortune secret from our ungrateful relatives. True, some will stutter at the bank. They don't just don't know we mean no harm. Breathless greetings and maybe terror will be felt. Oh well, a rose is a rose is a rose. The precious supplies will remain in the storehouse and it will be enough to save us and sustain us with those last silver drops. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting. Baby, let's hit the bank. I, I guess it's, yeah, that is the title. Baby, let's hit that bank. Um, and it, what, what I like about the poem, what, what works most is that it's a monologue where you can tell there's a distinct voice speaking in the poem. And so you can tell that aspect of it. I think that's the best quality. Um, there will only be a few moments where no one would notice. Uh, the ending we could give them will be so perfect and planned, so will. And, I, and th this is one of those poems, you know, what do the first four lines do? Really, like, nothing. They're just spinning their wheels. But if you jump to Baby, Let's Hit the Bank, it will be our last robbery. That's a much better first line, our great payout. No feeling to distract, no tragic sleep to wake from, no guilt to hide. So I think that works. Um yeah, um, Niliema Karkanis says uh, Clyde to Bonnie, and that's what I was thinking too, or at least some kind of um, you know reference to that. 
Yeah, James Lankefer says Lahaim is a Jewish word, I think. I, that's what I thought too. Let me let me look it up. Um Well, it would be spelled differently. Well, I guess it's just transliterated though. Um it means to life, a toast. Um usually it's transliterated, I guess, as L apostrophe C H A I M. Um but also L E H A Y I M. Does that make sense in context? Let's see. But we'll get we'll get to that in a second. So only yeah, only warm lahayams and that only warm lahayam that slides down easily on our shoulders. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, that works. We'll just have to keep our new fortune secret from our ungrateful relatives. Um. True. Some will stutter. So so as I'm reading the poem, and I think definitely cut the first four lines. If we jump right in. I can go along with a poem. It will be our last robbery, our great payout. As a metaphor for something, I don't think you're literally going to be, um, you know, if it's just talking about idly wondering if you should rob a bank, I don't think that's very interesting. But if that's a metaphor for something, then that, you know, for maybe taking the relationship, you know, ride or die kind of thing. Um, maybe that's what, if, if it works in that way. But I'm sort of waiting for that to come to pass at this point in the poem. You know, I'm waiting to see, I, I've sort of, you got me on board a little bit. I'm, I'm interested in where you're going to go with this, um, but let's see if it actually goes somewhere. And toward, right around here, I'm sort of wondering, you know, well, I think we'll just have to keep our new fortune secret from our ungrateful relatives. I, I'm wondering how that can be applied to this concept that we're, you know, that, that it's some kind of extended metaphor or, or something interesting. Where is it going? It seems a little too much just what would we do if we actually rob a bank, which is kind of boring because you're not going to rob a bank. And if you did... Um, I don't know. Even if you did rob a bank, the poem about it wouldn't be that interesting. So it's got to mean something more than that. Um, we'll just have to keep our new fortune secret from our ungrateful relatives. There's also, in this line, so we had a nice, it's a really simple music, but there's a music to the first you know, several lines um, in the rhythm and the sentence length. And then we get that no feeling to distract, the, the list, no tragic sleep to wake from, no guilt to hide. So there's a sense of music here. We completely lose into prose to me with this, uh, these two lines too. And so that's the poem's just getting sort of maybe off the track and not doing anything surprising at that point. And the voice starts to feel that way too, a little bit. Um, True, some will shudder at the bank. Shudder at the bank. They just don't know we mean no harm. Yeah, okay. So they'll be like scared at the bank. Breathless greetings and maybe terror will be felt. Oh, well, a rose is a rose is a rose. The precious supplies will remain in the storehouse. It will be enough to save us and sustain us with those last silver drops. So then by the time I get to this, so I start to get a little bored because it's there, it's not going anywhere interesting or surprising. And then in the end, it feels like um, we just robbed a bank and there's no real, there's no insight to it. So, so I think setting this up and then seeing where it leads is something that's interesting. There was a reason this poem came to be, uh, but then it doesn't, it, to me, it doesn't seem like it goes anywhere. So it didn't capitalize. It didn't like take a turn you know, if there was a door to open into some kind of, you know, different emotion or feeling, it didn't really go there. It sort of just stayed on the note of, of robbing the bank from the voice, and that, that's just not enough. Um, yeah. Um, um, BC McSee says, I wonder if this is a relationship that has lost excitement, and that could be, uh, you know, that's a way to put it, or, I mean, maybe. Um Yeah. Yeah, as Mary Keating says, I don't care about these characters. It seems like a th scene from a thousand movies. Exactly. Like, the, if it's just about robbing a bank, then it's not interesting. If it's about how that, f you know, some time in life or some relationship or something feels like you might rob a bank, that's kind of interesting. And so it needs to, um, it needs to do something beyond that. It needs to become a metaphor for something or move in some direction, do something surprising, and it just doesn't yet. So that's the, this problem. Let's go to the next one really quickly. Hawkins. When one turns suddenly to find that their best friend shares with them the same dream and is also laughing like a, belling to a bell tolling, say on some other day after the solstice had hovered over each of us like an infant's mobile, until dawn came and your garden then spread its mixture of scents racing through our home cradled by the flesh, fresh feel of sea air. By now, it had become a question-saving face, always had been, but we never understood it that way. Many in attendance thought that these were passing times and had existed in the past, though they descend, 
continues as rows upon rows surround. Palaces often look pleasant, only do not linger long there. I tell you now to stop and listen and backtrack before all is not well. So again, you know, going through, it's similar stuff to say about all the poems this week, and that's really the majority of the submissions and why we do this, so people can understand that it's hard to follow what's going on if you don't know the who, what, why, where, when, and how, and, and what's what's going on in the poem. Um, you know, so Hawkins, I'm not sure what that's a reference to. When one turns suddenly to find that their best friend shares with them the same dream and is also laughing like a bell tolling. Say some other day after the solstice had hovered over each of us like an infant's mobile. So I'm just, I've, I'm swimming in the, in the, the, the words, but I don't really, I don't really know what's being said. Deb C says, I'm lost again. Um, yeah. So, um. Yeah, so, so we don't know what the actual situation is. We don't know. We just don't have those details that let us connect. Um, Tom Barlow says Sadie Hawkins, and maybe if it was Sadie Hawkins, and, and who is Sadie Hawkins? I, I'm i trying to remember. Um, okay. The Sadie Hawkins dance, that's what the, that is. Sadie Hawkins dance. Um Named after the Little Abner comic strip character Sadie Hawkins, created by cartoonist Al Cap. In the strip, Sadie Hawkins' day fell on a given day in November. Cap never specified an exact date in which an unmarried woman of Dogpatch would chase the bachelors and marry up with ones that they caught. Oh, that's interesting. So I've heard the Sadie Hawkins dance, never knew where that came from. Um, it could be what it's about. We have no, I have no idea. <laughs> so... Um, until dawn came and your garden then spread its mixture of scents racing uh, through our home, cradled by the fresh feel of sea air. I, I just have no idea what's really going on. Uh, there's just I can't connect to it. By now, it had become a question of saving face, always had been, but we never understood it that way. Many attendants, so I mean, the attendants suggest maybe a dance. Um so if so, you know, Sadie Hawkins dance is a better title. So at least we know that that's the Hawkins we're talking about. Um, palaces often look pleasant, only do not linger there. I tell you, so who's the I and who's the you? Like we're at the last two lines of the poem. I don't know who who is speaking to whom. Um, and so it's just hard to connect to poems that don't have those kind of just basic details that we can figure out pretty quickly. Um, let's see. Yeah, um, Benjamin Barr says descent instead of in place of descend. Yeah, there. I think there's some typos in here through the, uh, or, or though the. I think it should be though they, um, and then descend should be, descent or though they descend, um, or it could be through the descent. But so so this is the problem. Like, um, people are always worried about the reason why. I, <laughs> this is a secret that I've never mentioned. I don't think is that the reason why I don't allow editing on um, um, submittable is because there are just so many tiny edits um, to a typo that's like an obvious typo and in submittable you have to manually open editing and then close it or else the poem sort of like gets lost in a limbo or the submission does and so you know so given the volume of submissions we receive which is like 250 300 a day um, it's just, it ended up, I had it open for like a week once and it was just a nightmare of having to open and close and looking to see what was open and closed. And I, every time I look at the changes, they'd be like one tiny, like typo that was fixed. It was obviously a typo in most cases. If the only typo was, um, you know, through instead of though, um, or I, mean, I guess this is not a good example, but there are a lot of times, you know, where the, it's just, um, they instead of there or something. It just makes no difference. I don't, couldn't care less. You know, if I'm going to publish the poem, I'm going to fix the typo. I don't care. I'm looking for poems to love. The fact that there's a typo just does not bother me. But, you know, sometimes the typos are bad enough that it gets confusing. And, you know, it's not like this poem would be published if it weren't for the typo. But we really, it's hard to follow that line, um, though the descent continues. I, I guess it should be descent. Through the, yeah, I guess it is more of an obvious one. 
you know, in the context, I didn't have really trouble with it. But this is the the point, though, is that typos happen. Don't worry about it. Try not to have them because they, and from an editor's perspective, they make it harder to read. And you have to trip over that and say, what do they mean? And it's pulling the editor out of the poem, too. So proofread, but but don't worry about it too much. And, and uh, I don't know. I hate the editable, the way editable works. If you could set it to make your own submissions editable and submittable, I'd turn it on and just let you do it. But I'm not going to spend an hour a day turning on and off um, <laughs> the editable feature on submit submissions. Um, yeah, Dick Westheimer says the the first rule of Poetry Club is obsessively read your poem many, t- many times to find syntax and spelling errors before submitting. Yeah, reading out loud really helps. Like you find things, um, you know, and read every word. Um, yeah. So anyway... So let's see. So people are saying Stranger Things, the, the show. I watched the first season. Mary Picot says Stranger Things is a series where a supernatural entity enters the town and races through the home. Hey, no spoilers. <laughs> I don't know. I, I watched the first season. Um, I, and I like the soundtrack. So Hawkins is the fictional town where Stranger Things is set. Hey, that could be too. We just don't know. We're guessing. Um, unless, let's see. So do we know for sure? Yeah, James Spencer says Stranger Things is a reference, I think. Um, When one turns suddenly to find that their best friend shares with them the same dream, is that part of the plot? I mean, maybe that's it. Maybe we need a little little more title um, to let us know (laughs) that it's Stranger Things. Um, Anyway. I'm going to do one more poem, and we're just going to move on from this one. Just more detail. Tell us the story. Let us in. Don't don't be obscure. Just be – the first step is is be clear. Second step, read your poems out loud. Um, and then once you sort of establish that you can write things clearly and let us know the story, then play with how much you reveal and stuff. But first thing, you know, early on, make sure that we can understand and follow you and that you know where you're going um, and, and be able to write a poem that's, that's clear that we don't have to wonder who's saying what to whom, where, and why, and what's actually going on. Just those details that you could say with a non-poetry, um, you know, a few sentences to explain who's saying what to whom, and you could summarize really easily. That's not where poetry lives. You know, the poetry lives in the in the beyond that, in the in the surprising creative chaos that comes from already knowing things, and then how can you mangle and push them together and have the emotions come out of them? There's never like I'm not going to reveal who's actually speaking. And then because of that, there'll be a revelation at the end where you'll realize who's actually speaking and, and the poem works. It's just not what poetry is actually doing. So, so let us know, um, you know, ahead, let us know. And you can do it in one sentence, usually, what's actually going on. And then we'll know. And then we'll be able to connect more. And the, the chances of us connecting on an emotional level will be much higher. Okay, let's do uh, another poem here. And I got to remember... Just put it on me for a second, too, while I pull up, because who knows what's going to pop up. <laughs> you never know. I mean, sometimes there have been some uh, some interesting things to pop up in submissions. So we'll do one more. We're up to March, which is good. Um, the poet is um, Excel Carlo Dogalacion. And this is, oh, Fiona, where is your heart? No questions. Uh, we have two poems. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll do both really quick. But here's, oh, Fiona, where is your heart? Here we go. O Fiona, where is your heart? Again, a pasted in poem. O Fiona, where is your heart? O Fiona, you beg to be throned. You are the king's little pea, his incumbent power, and never the last hurrah. We casted you in and up. You were an adamant fist, yet a mirror of your father, another heartless dynasty. The bourgeoisie was fooled. Silly that we believed again in rewinded sworn oaths, in red letters and envelopes. O Fiona, where is your heart? Where are your people? We, We are your people. We are your kin, but we never have your heart. O Fiona, where is your heart? So again, this is just a theme. And, and, and this is really, like if you look at the submissions, this is the, the thing that comes up just so often is that it's really hard to figure out what's actually going on. Oh, who's a Fiona? Um, maybe that's a reference. Um, you know, I, I think it's safe. Very few references are safe <laughs> to just say without letting us know what you're referencing. Um, 
you know, and maybe, you know, T.S. Eliot can do it because he, he knows that, <laughs> you know, his poem is going to end up in a um, college classroom. But when you're someone flipping through a literary magazine in a doctor's office, which is sort of my vision for what Rattle is, it's always been our vision is like you could pick it up and, and see is the person sitting in a doctor's office in Boise, Idaho, going to recognize that is somebody you know, sitting, you know, who gets it in the mail in in the Philippines is going to get this reference and know who Fiona is. You know, there, there's a, a way that you have to sort of just point at least to the right direction. And I'm not sure who Fiona is. Maybe people have a suggestion here. I mean, Fiona was the princess in Shrek. <laughs> it could be. Um, I don't know. So, yeah. Rose says the P is the one in the princess in the P fable. So so that maybe suggests that it is Fiona from Shrek. Oh, Fiona, where is your heart? Oh, Fiona, you beg to be throned. Did Fiona beg to be throned in the Shrek? You're the king's little P, his incumbent power, and never the last hurrah. So see, the thing, the thing is this. Poems are just not puzzles. It's not like some Rubik's Cube where we're supposed to sit here and if we fold the sentences together in the right pattern, we come up with, oh, this is the color blue. That's not what a poem is. It's not a puzzle. Um, it's something where you're conjuring this space. The, the breath of the, the author is entering your body. You're sort of letting that in. And then you're experiencing empathetically um, what that voice is saying. You get to walk in that voice's shoes and that voice's breath and then feel and experience the world through somebody else's eyes um, and, and the complexity of emotions that's going on there and the, and the different ideas that are floating around and everything that's connecting. That's what a poem is. It's not teasing apart what, what Fio, who Fiona is. So, um, so we got to know that. Um, okay. So, so that's just it. Another, another puzzle poem. Um, and, and the thing is the, the purpose of the critique is to critique of the week is to help people. And so I could go through these, uh, submissions and just say puzzle poem, puzzle poem. And it, you know, for the, everyone here every week, you know exactly what I meant, but we want to explain this to the actual poet. That's the goal to help. So, um, so here you go. Um, and then Liamma Karkana says Fiona Gallagher, which also doesn't really mean anything to me, but at least that, if it's a name, Fiona Gallagher, I could Google that and figure it out. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's look at the other one, see if that has a similar problem really quickly. A letter to my students and to all the teachers who felt the same. So here, I like this. This is a much better start to the poem already because, you know, it's a letter to my students. So I'm a teacher with students talking to them. So this is the kind of thing where in this poem, we get to know what's going on and it's not a puzzle, at least so far. Um, and we have a sense of what it is that we can go along with and to all the teachers who felt the same. So we're sort of, it's like an open letter to my students and other teachers. And, and, and that's a great, that's the kind of touchstone that we need to be able to follow and connect with the poem. So that's a great, great title, great use of that. Let's see where it goes. Teachers are your second parents. They can be your second moms and dads. You might not come from their wombs, but you grow on their palms of their hands. Teachers are your friends at school. They can be your next-in-line supporters who cheer during your fights and comps, who whistle as you score a point or two. Teachers are artists and molders. They sculpt you to be a catalyst of change. They inspire you to outdo your best and to bring out what's beneath that skin. Teachers are your instant frontliners. They nurse you when you're hot and feverish. They stand by you when you're feeling low and aid you like their own blood children. Teachers are the listeners of your voice and such, uh, and such when nobody does, they will. Their ears and hearts listen as you speak, even if your voice, your secrets and telltales. Teachers are your monstrous harsh critics. They won't tell you mediocrity, but the truth, even if it hurts, but it will help you grow, learn, and use it as you go further. Teachers are your sword and shield. They are your knights in heavy armories. They shall fight for you when you are right. They shall defend you when others do wrong. Teachers are your long lost children, childhood heroes, those you see caped and flying in television, who save the ones that cry for help, who carries you into the world that's safe. 
uh, into a world that is safe. Teachers are your number one fans. They honor you as you grow in success. They wail seeing you suffer in the dark. Paint them with smiles of your beautiful future. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so this poem, um, um, it's sort of uh, didactic. Uh, no pun intended, given the topic. Um, but it's sort of preaching at us a, a, a moral lesson or, a, or how we should think and view teachers. It has an agenda, um, and it's just telling that agenda to us. Um, Dempsey says there are good, some good things about the teacher poem, but I wish it had more surprise in it uh, to help keep me engaged, perhaps somewhat banal uh, or banal. Um, Josh Williams says Hallmark-like, but the thing is, you know, the, um, you know if you're going to write a kind of... Um, a poem like this that that sort of is I don't know, hallmark like that kind of you know, expressing a sentiment um you know make it rhyme you know and some people will appreciate it um so there's that too i mean you know the dads and hands i thought it was the rhyme was going to come it feels like it wants to rhyme but then it doesn't um but but the main thing is that it's didactic as, as clayton clark says it stayed the same throughout and that's the thing it has a position and the problem with the position um, is that once you realize the position, you know the position, and it, and it just you could have just told me your position. Like teachers are great, <laughs> and and that's true. Um, so so a poem uh, we can show. Uh, let's let's do this. So uh, we'll we'll close it out after this this poem. But let's look at um, um, let's look at Taylor Molly's, of course. What teachers make. Um, and this is a funny poem kind of because it was published, um, we published it in our slam poetry issue. It was the first time it appeared in print, but already it was so famous that when my, um, aunt Judy, who was a teacher, she's a math teacher, like a sixth grade math teacher her whole life. When she read this poem, she said, it, she told me it was plagiarized cause she'd read it before. <laughs> and, um, and it's because it was already viral in email chains, um, all over the place um, from from Slam, where it came from. So this is uh, Taylor Molly's What Teachers Make. And look at how this poem it does the exact same thing. It's the same sort of goal, um, you know, getting us to appreciate teachers more, which we should. I mean, nobody disagrees with that. Uh, it's a wonderful sort of mission for a poem to have. But um, uh, but it does it in a way that we we just, once we know what's coming, that's all that's coming, and it doesn't really add in or give anything. But listen to how this goes. Um, and this is a more performance poem, uh, but it's a it's a great performance poem. But see how it it takes it comes at it from a slant. You know, there's that phrase "tell it slant." Who said that? Was it, gosh, was it Emily Dickinson or was it who said "tell it slant"? Uh, oh gosh, I can't. I hate that I can't remember that. It's one of the most famous quotes in poetry. Um, was it Dickinson? Okay, it was Dickinson. She should tell, tell the truth, but tell it slant. So that's Emily Dickinson. Um, and uh, and that's what we want to do so that we can sort of get at things underneath the sort of expectations and the sort of layer of sort of the defenses we have almost um, against kind of didactic speech. Um, you know, you want it to hit us from a subtle angle so we actually feel it rather than just engage on this like shallower intellectual level. What it really is 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 didactic stuff engages with the left brain and that that really direct focus the world of sort of its own mental constructs that it refuses to look past. And what you want is to get underneath that and form new constructs with the poem, the stuff of the right brain, that creative energy. And um, and so so you have to get come it from an angle to get under that sort of layer of all the modeling and understanding we already think we have in order to get some new understanding to, to blossom up. And that's what a poem is doing too on, on that level. And so what teachers make comes at it from this angle, but the exact same points. You know, it's saying this is what, you know, teachers matter, damn it, is what this poem is saying. It's what the original poem is saying, but let's take a look. I'm not going to play it because I think the audio, I think Taylor has a CD and we'll get a copyright strike if we actually play it, but I'll just read it. Uh, what teachers make. Or if things don't work out, you can always go to law school. He says the problem with teachers is what's a kid going to learn from someone who decided his best option in life was to become a teacher. He reminds me of other, the other dinner guests that it's true what they say about teachers, those who can do, those who can't teach. 
I decide to bite my tongue instead of his and resist the temptation to remind the dinner guests that it's also true what they say about lawyers, because we're eating, after all, and this is polite company. I mean, you're a teacher, Taylor. Be honest. What do you make? And I wish he hadn't done that. Ask me to be honest, because, you see, I have a policy in my classroom about honesty and ass-kicking. If you ask for it, then I have to let you have it. You want to know what I make? And so this is sort of the build-up. That's almost really an introduction, because it's a slam poem. Um, you know, if it was a page poem, it might actually work just saying, do you want to know what I make? And we would jump in there. But the, but the slam is a performance, and so we have this sort of set up the context, which is what I was talking about with all those other poems. You know, in this sort of preamble that Taylor does, he sets up this dinner party scenario to let us see and envision what's going on. So when we get the speech that he's about to give, um, we can connect with it. We can sort of see it happening, and then we can feel it a lot more strongly. So anyway, so the guy says, what do you make, Taylor? He says, you want to know what I make? I make kids work harder than I ever thought they could. I, make a C, I can make a C feel like a Congressional Medal of Honor and an A- minus feel like a slap in the face. How dare you waste my time with anything but your very best? I make kids sit through 40 minutes of study hall in absolute silence. No, you, do not, you may not work in groups. No, you may not ask a question. So put your hand down. Why won't I let you go to the bathroom? Because you're bored and you don't really have to go to the bathroom, do you? So there he's got these uh, tangible examples of what teachers do. You can see the kid uh, being bored pretending he has to go to the bathroom like that that detail lets you know more clearly the actual experiences of the teacher it's those specific details that sell the concept even though the thing is trying to present the same thing that this poem is presenting um, i make parents tremble in fear when i call home hi this is mr molly i hope i haven't called at a bad time i just wanted to talk to you about something your son said today to the biggest bully in class he said leave the kid alone i still cry sometimes don't you and it was the noblest act of courage i have ever seen so another specific detail of an anecdote that and you can imagine this little scene playing out of um of, of, of the kid being noble and brave. And it's, you see it's sort of a slice of the teacher's day. You get to experience what it's like to be a teacher through this poem and to have that, um, you know, that compassion and, and that love of their job. Like all that's coming through just because we get these very specific details. We set up the frame. We know exactly where we are. We know who's speaking. We know, you know, we know all of that stuff. And so we get to go along for the ride and then feel what it's like to be a teacher. I make parents see their children by, for who they are and what they can be. You want to know what I make? I make kids wonder. I make them question. I make them criticize. I make them apologize and mean it. I make them write, 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 and then I make them read. I make them spell definitely beautiful, definitely beautiful, definitely beautiful over and over again until they will never misspell either one of those words again. I make them show all their work in math and hide it in their final drafts in English. I make them understand if you've got this, then you follow this. And if someone ever tries to judge you by what you make, you give them this, the middle finger. Here, let me break it down for you so you know what I say is true. Teachers make a goddamn difference. Now, what about you? And, of course, that's the great line. Um, and, of course, he sort of, you know, he sets, if you, you can watch the YouTube video or one of his performances of this, but he sets the scene, sort of casually telling the story. Then he gives this monologue, and he's building up energy and intensity into that last line, which is the memorable part, which makes the poem go viral. And so, you know, that's the kind of coming in from an angle, setting it up. I think it's a great example of all the things we've been talking about for the last hour and 20 minutes. So, um, so there you go. Um, and it, is it didactic? Kind of, because he has a point he's trying to preach to you. But he comes at this from this other angle, paints this whole world and creates it out of nothing that you can enter and you can become a teacher for that. How long is a poem? It takes him, uh, it takes him what? Two minutes and 50 seconds. In two minutes and 50 seconds, you become a teacher. And that's what a poem really is. That's what Teachers Make by Taylor Molly. Uh, I think it won one of the poetry slams at some point, like 1996 or something. Um, anyway, it's from Rattle. If you want to, you can still buy copies if you have a CD player. You can still buy Rattle number 27, um, a tribute to slam poetry, and um, interviews with the founder of slam poetry, Patricia, uh, Mark Smith, Mark Kelly Smith, and uh, the sort of queen of slam poetry, the like, seven-time national poetry champion, Patricia Smith, also a CD you can pop into. I guess your car maybe still has a CD player. I don't know. If anybody has a CD player, you can pop that in and listen to all the uh, slam poems in there. But that's from that. So anyway, that is uh, it. So I hope you enjoyed the critique of the week. I'm a lot of me talking at the end, but hopefully it was useful. Now, let's see. So, um, yeah. 
Okay, well, anyway, yeah, that's going to wrap up the critique. Thanks, everybody, for being here in this new studio. I'm going to get the keyframe frequency or whatever the heck that is fixed. I don't know. I'm going to have to play it back and see if that mattered. But no matter what, we are going to uh, be doing another Rattlecast on Monday night, as we always do. Or, well, usually, sometimes we do it during the day, or sometimes on a Tuesday, like when it was uh, the day after Christmas. But anyway, <laughs> this week's guest in the Rattlecast, we'll see if I actually put the slide up right. Let's see. Miracle Thornton. Yes, I did. So that's Rattlecast number 227. Miracle Thornton was the winner of um, one of the three winners of last year's Rattle Chatbook Prize contest. Perfect timing for having her the guest because this year it's a week before the deadline. So if you'd like to enter the Rattle Chatbook Prize, of course, three winners receive $5,000 publication of the chapbook and full distribution to our 9,500, 9, 9,500 subscribers have read a copy of Plucked already. Um, so it's really the best prize in all of poetry. Um, I wish I could enter. <laughs> and so uh, you should if you haven't yet. But anyway, Miracle Thornton was a winner of that. Her book Plucked is about um, growing up into young black girlhood um, a really wonderful and sort of abstract, interesting collection. I'm really excited to talk to her about it finally um, after putting the book together. The prompt for the for the uh, prompt lines uh, was, let me see if I, st- if I have it up yet, because we're waiting. Yeah, so it's write a poem that uses extended metaphor to describe a period of your life and use a rhyme scheme of some kind. So that was inspired by last week's guest, of course. And who was last week's guest? Oh, yeah, Matthew Buckley-Smith. So uh, that's next week's prompt. Next week's guest, Miracle Thornton, Rattlecast number 227, Monday, January 8th, the regular time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, Talk to you then. I hope you have a great weekend. In the meantime, goodbye.